We get it. We understand. We want them to get treatment, and we want them to get treatment as soon as possible. And this is a community issue that we're facing here. The law enforcement understands that, and we will help any addict that wants to get help. Um, as you know, the Good Samaritan Act is in play. We continually remind folks every day through public service announcements, even the folks that come into the jail, it doesn't matter what the narcotic violation may be. Uh, it could be a dealer, it could be someone who just had a little bit of marijuana on their, in, in their pocket. No matter what the charge may have been, if they're ever brought into the jail, they're given a card, I didn't bring one with me today, and it tells them about the Good Samaritan Act, it tells them some of the signs to look for, we can do paperwork to, to help educate them, and, and get them the, the resources and help they need. That is our intent. I wish I could stand up here to you, to you all today and talk about something else than this huge epidemic. Um, my detectives are very, very busy right now. I can tell you that. Probably the busiest I've seen them in my association. So, um, Jerry sent me some questions. So I'm gonna go over a few questions and I wanna answer them. I spoke to you, to the group uh, last year, probably around eight months or so ago. So Sydney gave me a couple questions and, and I'll, I'll try to answer them for you. And if you got any questions at the end, just, uh, or if you got a question actually during the presentation, just raise your hand and we can try to answer them for you, okay? So one of the questions is, why does it take so long to bust a dealer? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. I can't just walk up to, my undercovers just can't walk up to a guy who's selling, let's say, at a car wash. We know he's selling. How do we know? Well, you see a lot of short-term traffic, you get complaints coming in from the public. Folks like you that are like sick and tired of activity going on, or your child may tell you that this person's selling narcotics. Well, how are we gonna go get narcotics from this guy? You think if I just walk up to him, is he gonna sell to me? Is he gonna sell to this 21-year-old face? <laughs> no, he's not. Not, I don't trust you. So I can assure you my undercover narcotics don't look like you. They look, they look, they look the part to some degree. And uh, so it's very, very difficult because you don't have that trust. You don't have an inroad. You don't know how to get into some of these folks. But we deploy a lot of strategies to do that. And I'm not gonna go over every strategy in which how we can get into some of these folks. But that's, that's an obstacle we gotta, we gotta um, overcome. And we do, we do sometimes. Um, so dealers, we just worked an investigation, you may have read it in the paper, it's probably about eight months we worked. I can tell you dealers go to great, great lengths to conceal their, their ways. They're on their toes. They're doing a number of different things to thwart law enforcement. And they're aware of some of, the, some of our strategies, that's why I'm not, I don't really like to speak about them in public because you know, they're gonna try to stay two steps ahead of us and we will continue to stay aggressive on them. And sometimes it just takes a while. You know, I'd like to grab every uh, person trafficking narcotics and be able to make a, a, a decent criminal charge that's gonna take them off the street so that supply can't come in. But unfortunately, that's not how it works, particularly through, even through the criminal justice system. And I talk about this in a little bit, about bonds and when we arrest somebody for trafficking, and we get this question, why are they out on the streets? I share your same concern. I want to know that too. We just arrested a guy last month for trafficking heroin. What in the world is he doing out on the streets again? Because his only source of income has been narcotic sales. What do you think he's going to revert back to or she's going to revert back to? And by the time they get to the front of a judge and they work its way through the criminal justice system, it could be up to a year sometimes before they actually get sentenced. And then the sentencing is a whole different uh, can of worms. So we just arrested some guy uh, <coughs> last night, matter of fact, trafficking heroin, about six counts, significant person, um, as far as we're concerned, as far as uh, a lot of the narcotics he's been selling. Uh, and he thwarted us, we tried to capture him three separate occasions. Once he took his car and rammed one of our guys. Car. Second, he was able to evade us, so I'll just leave it at that. Yesterday we were able to capture him. 
And uh, when we captured him, of course, uh, he's got a trafficking amount of heroin, he's got a significant amount of cash, and he's got a nine millimeter gun. So this is what the detectives are facing on a daily basis. And if, let me just give you an example how that could have turned real ugly, okay? The first time we got him, he ran over our car, he's running all over Cortez and US 41, ducking in and out of traffic. He doesn't care about you, 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 he doesn't care about anybody here. His objective is to get out and think about this. If your family member, your spouse is driving down Cortez Road, he's sitting there at the red light, and here comes a drug dealer with a nine millimeter gun, telling that he's going to be arrested because he knows what he's doing is wrong. And he doesn't care. He's gonna ram into your car. He's gonna do whatever it takes to get out. That's what we're facing. That's what my undercovers face every day when they go do a, a deal. There's that threat of violence. These guys are bringing guns. These guys are serious. And again, they don't care about you, and they certainly don't care about law enforcement. So we've got to be careful in our tech to make sure the community remains safe while still enforcing the laws. And sometimes that's not easy. It's not an easy job. So those are some of the obstacles we face. And again, dealers go to great lengths to conceal their methods of operation. And it's not so easy to get into them. But I can assure you, as you've seen, we are having success. We will continue to have success. And I will say it again and again and again. Sooner or later, we will catch them. Sooner or later, we will catch them. Um, the next question that a lot of people ask is, particularly when it comes to heroin. I'm not a lawyer. I didn't sleep at a Holiday Inn last night. Okay. Forewarning it, but there's a lawyer in here. There she is. Um, there's a murder charge. There's a charge. It's a murder charge. Okay, it's been in the paper. We've we talked about it. We spoke to the state attorney's office. I have a state attorney that works in our office. And what we do is we meet with the criminal uh, investigation division. They are responsible for all overdose deaths. Okay, and if and I'm gonna read it to you verbatim, so just bear with me for a second because this is what the statute says and I wanna be real clear because a lot of people ask us, why isn't the dealer being charged with murder? They provided heroin that resulted in the death of my spouse, or my sibling, or a friend. I want them to go to jail for murder. Can I tell you this? I do too. I do too. I think they should be held to the most highest accountability and they have blood on their hands. Um, and I can tell you that every single case is reviewed by a detective. Overdose death, it goes right to a homicide detective. And they're reviewing it. And we work with them to look at every detail of that case. Because it's, unfortunately, it's just not that easy. And I'm going to tell you why it's not that easy. It's in the law. But that doesn't mean we can't overcome it. It doesn't mean we can't.